Hello, I'm Adam Hardy. I'm an architect and architectural historian. In this little talk, I would like to give you a glimpse of the role of architectural drawings in the creation of temple architecture in medieval India and how drawings can do their job after hundreds of years if they're properly preserved. My subject is what would have been the biggest ever temple in India. It's unfinished and it has a uniquely coherent set of architectural drawings at the site engraved on the rocks. I'm talking, of course, about the royal temple of Raja Bhuj at Bhujpur, 28 kilometers south of Bhopal in Madhya Pradesh. The patron of the temple was the Parmara king Bhuja of Dar, who ruled in Malwa in central India from about 1010 to 1055. He's remembered as an ideal king, a warrior and a scholar, who aimed to assemble and advance the many branches of human knowledge at his court. Among the numerous written works ascri ascribed to him is the Samarangana Sutradhara, a famous architectural treatise. The Shiva temple, sometimes called the Bhujeshvara temple, must be seen as part of Bhuja's ambitious cultural and political project. The first half of the 11th century was a time when suddenly we see the appearance of enormous royal temples. For example, the Lingaraj temple at Bhubaneswar, or the biggest of all, well over 60 metres high, Raja Raja Chola's Brihadishvara temple at Tanjavur. This was also a time when temple architects had an awareness of the different regional traditions of temple architecture, north and south, as is very clear in the Samarangana Sutradhara. And temple architects in central India were doing something unprecedented. They were inventing a new form of temple, not out of nothing, but consciously incorporating elements from the northern Nagara and the southern Dravida traditions. The new temple form is known as Bhumija, and Bhumija temples were adopted by the Parmara rulers as their special temple form. The example shown here is the beautiful Udayeshvara temple at Udayapur, also known as the Nilakanteshvara. It was founded and built by a later Parmara ruler, Udayaditya, and dedicated in 1080. The Bhumija form, in this case a stellate or, or star-shaped one, is recognisable by the chains of kuta stambhas, that's uh, pillars with little shikharas on top, running in ribs up the height of the tower. And by the central shala, a miniature temple projecting out of the bhadra, the central projection, which is full of central Indian interpretations of southern forms. This unfinished royal temple once stood on the shores of an enormous lake known as the Bhim Tal. This vast lake was created by Bhoja to irrigate the region. West of the temple, where the Betwa River enters a small gorge, are the remains of a crucial part of the system of dams built to create this lake. The dams were made from thousands of huge stone blocks, gigantic blocks of carved masonry destined for the temple, still lie scattered around the rocky site. The rock bed surrounding the temple served both as the quarry and as the drawing board. And at the site, we can still see the remains of the earthen ramp used for heaving up the enormous stones as the temple rose.
At the top left-hand side of this slide is an example of one of the drawings. It's a gavaksha or horseshoe arch, and you can see the lovely graceful line of the engraving. The photos are from the nearby site of Ashapuri, all in ruins and very little known. The site had been very important in the early development of the Bhumija temple form. Stylistically, I think it's very clear that masons went from Ashapuri to work at Bhojpur, and suddenly they were having to work at a vastly greater scale. These beautiful, these beautiful line drawings provide insights into building processes and glimpses of hitherto unknown temple forms. Some illustrate architectural principles, others are sketchy and experimental, while others are full-scale drawings for use during construction. A few years ago, with the help of colleagues and students, I was able to document these drawings. They were sketched and measured, and then drawn up to scale, first in AutoCAD, and then traced over and redrawn to correct them and to make them look nice. The temple as it stands today is a massive cube of masonry. A great doorway dominates the western façade, while the remaining three sides are smooth. Inside, four 12-metre-high pillars define nine bays. The large central bay was going to be spanned by a corbelled ceiling. For a long time, this was incomplete and open to the sky, but it has now been covered over by the Archaeological Survey of India. In the centre of the temple rises a mighty Shivalinga. In front of the doorway extends a platform which seems to have been built a little after Bhuja's time. Because they're very big, if you go to the site it's not always easy to see what the drawings are. They're also quite worn out, so redrawing them helps us to see them as a whole. Three of the drawings are of pillars or pilasters. This one is a full-size de design for the four interior pillars. In other words, it's one, at a scale of one to one. It's drawn as if it's square, while the actual pillars are octagonal, transforming into 16 sides as you go up, and then they're circular at the top. Drawings like this would be used as a reference for extracting the required block sizes from the adjacent quarry and also for making templates, probably of wood, to guide the carving of mouldings. As well as the sectional profile, some details of the elevation are shown, such as the Gavaksha motif in the necking. Here's another drawing, this time a pilaster, the corner pilasters that you see in the corners of the Garbhagriha. This drawing shows the same pillar type as we've, as we've just seen, both in an upright version and twisted into a bracket down below. Although it's not immediately clear on the ground, since the, since the drawing is about six metres long, it is actually a one-to-one -one drawing for the blind balconies that are on the outside of the temple walls. Again, some features of elevation are shown, as well as the sectional profile. This one's a bit of a riddle at first. At the bottom, it looks a bit like a rather languid farmsoner roof. Put it the right way up, and we see that actually it's a ceiling. The pavilion with the flag at the bottom belongs to the chain of little shrines that runs around the supporting beam. And what at first looks like an upside down roof is actually a lotus like pendant. This one's really confusing at first because it's all overlapped. But if we disaggregate it, we find a bracket, turn it the right way up, 
the base mouldings on the facade of the temple and a half door sill to Chandrashila at the foot of the steps going up to the main doorway. And lo and behold, if we take away all the overlapping bits and we double it up, we have exactly to scale one to one the plan of the temple facade as it exists today. And somewhere else there is a drawing of the pilasters on the front of the temple. So what I've shown you so far are drawings of parts of the temple that were actually built. Pillars, ceiling, balcony, pilasters, brackets, mouldings, and a plan of the temple front. Could it be that there are drawings of parts of the temple that were never actually built? But before I answer that, let me show you a different kind of drawing. This is a drawing which I think is intended for one of the smaller temples at the site. It shows a half of a Bhumija Shikara with five ratas, Pancharata and Panchabhumi, five uh, Bhumis or levels. It's not a working drawing, it's not at all concerned with details. But it does what a Vastu Shastra text does, conveys succinctly the underlying design framework. The text does it with words, this does it with lines. Its, its composition and proportions correspond closely to the Bhumija type called the Malayadri temple in Bhuja's architectural treatise, the Samarangana Sutradhara. This is my drawing from that text. There's a relatively close correspondence between text and practice in the case of Bhumija temples because the temple architects, I believe, were working out the theory and the practice side by side. Well, yes, there are full-size drawings of bits of the temple that were never built. This beautiful drawing is of the mouldings of the pitta or sub-base and the lower part of the vedibhanda, the moulded base of the, of the intended temple. We know this because if we look at some of the mouldings that have been carved and are still lying around on the site and we measure them and draw them up, they correspond exactly to that drawing. For comparison, here are the Pita and Vedibandha of the Udayeshvara temple. We can also compare this drawing with the massive base mouldings of the Bija Mandal at Vidisha, another unfinished, huge, ambitious royal temple, not quite as big as Bhojpur, planned by Bhoja's successor. And let's look at the plan of the Bija Mandal. This is how it is today with three entrance staircases. And I think we can be pretty sure that the original intention was a Chaturmukh four-faced monument like this. So let's finally look at the plan. At the site we have this drawing, which is a fragment of the plan but contains all the necessary information. It's rather big, it's about 15 metres across. It's also quite worn out, so difficult to grasp until we have drawn it up. So here goes. Flip it and double it up. Same again, 
and remember the Bija Mandal plan, same again, and this is what we get. And in case you're in any doubt, we can take the plan of the existing temple drawn at the same scale as the drawing on the rock, and it fits exactly. And there's even a single grid which integrates the whole. So we have the temple as it exists today as the Garbhagriha, an ambulatory around it, at the centre of a four-faced temple. So at last we can move on from the plan to the elevation. We have the scale drawings of the Pitta with its mouldings, so we can draw those up to the same scale as the plan, or at least sketch them. We can place the existing temple on the Pitta as the Garbhagriha. Then we can add the Vedi Bandha and the first Bhumi. We have seven projections, Saptarata, so proportions are going to dictate that we need seven levels or Bhumis. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's add the Vedi and the Ghanta, and we have a Shikara around 100 metres high, the biggest temple in India, which dwarfs the mighty Brihadishvara. All that remains now is for us to imagine the temple in its landscape, towering over the rocky slopes above the Bhimtal Lake. If completed, the shikara of the temple at Bhojpur would have ranked as the centuries passed with the loftiest monuments the world over. Mirrored in its lake, doubled up like an expanding Shivalinga, this would have been the architectural, religious and political pinnacle of Bhoja's ambitious cultural project. But of course, the temple was never finished. We don't know why. Maybe it was just too ambitious. Yet its secrets and its potential have lain for a thousand years on the surrounding rocks.